first of all a very good evening and warm welcome to each and every one in kale hall of gokhale institute of politics and economics pune today we are gather here to commemorate world population day world population day is observed on 11th july and has been observed across the globe it aims to understand the contemporary population issue at regional level as well as global level the world population day was established in 1989 by the governing council of united nation development program undp the inspiration for this day was the peaking public interest in the celebration of 5 billion day on july 11 1987 the original date was decided to be set as world population day by united nation general assembly and resolution 45 by 216 made this official in 9 december 1990 friends as the event this is bal govin chauhan and it is my privilege to welcome you all on behalf of population research center and gokhale institute of politics and economics to celebrate world population day it is really a an honor for me to welcome you all first and foremost we thank and welcome our chief guest dr s y kureishi sir and our esteemed speakers professor p m kulkarni sir professor r b bhagat sir and professor rajeshwari deshpande madam for accepting our invitation at short notice and taking out time from their busy schedule to be part of this event it is really an honor for us that you have accepted our invitation we whole heartedly welcome all the audience gather here and those who joined online to make this event successful indeed it's a pleasure to see all you here we are really overwhelmed by your presence we are very grateful to our honorable vice chancellor dr ajit rana de sir head of the organizing committee and meeting of the organizing committee and all the volunteer who have helped to arrange this program so before going to our main program i would like to give a brief about gokhale institute of politics and economics and population research center gokhale institute of politics and economics was established in 1930 by the servant of india society and this is the oldest economic research institute in india the institute is noted for empirical research particularly field based research in agriculture economics poverty and population studies some of the product of this institute such as study on poverty in india made in 1971 by v m dandekar and neel kanthrat are classic in their field a combination of teaching and research is one of its unique features currently institute offers six master level program in economics that is considered among the best in the country the institute has started bsc in economics in the year 2019-20 today the institute had awarded doctoral degree to near, nearly 200 students since 1996 in 1993 the university grant commission declared it as a deemed university in recognition of the teaching and research undertaken the national assessment and accreditation council awarded it a a grade in 19 2016 the library of the institute is one of the foremost among specialized library in india in the field of economics and other sciences in 2005 the library completed its centenary year today its collection include 273000 books and 373 journals including almost all the leading english language journal in economics so after this now i would like to give brief about the population research center so the ministry of health and family welfare established a net network of population research center with the mandate to provide critical research based input related to health and family welfare program and policies at the national and state level the prc is were established to undertake research project relating to family planning demographic research and biological studies and qualitative aspects of population control with a view to gain for utilize the feedback from research studies for plan formulation strategies and modification of ongoing research schemes presently there are 18 population research center in india of which 12 are located in universities and 
सिक्स आर इन रिपोर्टेड इंस्टीट्यूशन स्कैटर्ड ओवर सिक्सटीन मेजर स्टेट ऑफ इंडिया रिगार्डिंग दिस आवर पॉपुलेशन रिसर्च सेंटर ऑफ गोखले इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स एंड इकोनॉमिक्स सो ए रिसर्च सेंटर इन डेमोग्राफी वॉज सेट अप एट द इंस्टीट्यूट इन लेट नाइनटीन फोर्टी नाइन दिस वॉज द फर्स्ट ऑफ इस काइंड द यूनियन मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ हेल्थ एंड फैमिली वेलफेयर गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया गेव ग्रांट टू इंस्टीट्यूट फॉर कंटेंट कंडक्टिंग स्पेसिफिक स्टडी ड्यूरिंग नाइनटीन फिफ्टी फोर एंड फिफ्टी सेवन इन नाइनटीन सिक्सटी थ्री द मिनिस्ट्री डिसाइडेड टू एक्सटेंड दैन एंड एक्सटेंड द रिसर्च वर्क ऑन पॉपुलेशन बाई स्टेब्लिशिंग ए डेमोग्राफिक रिसर्च सेंटर एज ए पार्ट ऑफ द इंस्टीट्यूट इन नाइनटीन सेवेंटी एट सेवेंटी नाइन इन परसुवेंस ऑफ द रिकमेंडेशन The center was re-designated as a population research center for the state of Maharashtra. Since the 50s, the center started its work by conducting demographic survey and thus contributed in a large way to the area of survey methodology. In 2014, a census work station has been established at the institute. Recently, with the help of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, population research center. Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics has established a digital population clock uh, nearby our main gate of the institute to sensitize the civilian about population growth. So this was the small introduction of our Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics and Population Research Center. Let's come back to our main pro main program. So uh, before going to further in the depth of this program. i would like to give a overview of sequence of program how we are going so the whole program is divided into two parts in first part there is a panel discussion on on the significance of caste census and in the second part we will have a guest lecture on population myth by our honorable chief guest dr kureshi sir so for the panel discussion we have three eminent speaker from different organization present here with us all the speaker are from diverse fields and they are the stalwarts of their respective fields i say first step towards this program without taking much of your time now i would like to invite dr vinish shivanandan to come up on a dais and throw some lights on the significance of world population day so uh, before she take over the mic i would like to invite her to the audience So, Dr. Vini Sivananda is an assistant professor and head of the Department of Population Research Center, Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics. She has multiple research projects in her bag and like to mentor research assistant and students as part of large research projects. She is a doctorate in population studies from the International Institute for Population Sciences, Mumbai. Her research interests are the area of population, education, health, and development. She is interested in the challenges which arise in health issues, and how to implement and to build a reliable public health system for a complex and diverse population, are the central question that drives her research. With this, I request Madam to please come on dais and throw some lights on significance of World Population Day. Madam, please. Over to you, Madam. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bal Govin. uh so distinguished dis dignitaries and participants ladies and gentlemen good afternoon thank you to each one of you for being for being here with us today it is indeed a privilege to speak on the occasion of world population day now what is world population day many of might not be aware it aware of it so just a brief history of the world population day on the 11th of july 1987 world population reached 5 billion and inspired by the public interest world population day was established by the governing council of the united nation development program in 1989 the day is observed every year annually to raise the awareness about global population issues so today in 2022 the world will mark its 33rd world population day The theme for this year is a world of 8 billions towards a resilient future for all harnessing opportunities and ensuring rights and choices for all. In 2011 the world population crossed the 7 billion mark. The day was a major achievement why why because 
it escalated life duration from 30 years in 1800 to 67 years in 2011 thus leading to a rapid boom in population from 1 billion to 7 billion according to the united nations department of economic and social affairs even though the pace of global population growth will continue to decline in the coming decades please note it will continue to decline in the coming decades the world population is likely to be between 20 and 30 percent larger in 2050 as compared to the year 2020 and having an accurate estimation of population trends and reliable forecast of future changes including the size of the population and their distribution by age social groups gender and region is required for policy formulation and implementations and as a guide to assist countries in following a path towards sustainable development although marked development has taken place inequality is deeply entrenched in all our domains of our life while the population is growing in some countries a number of countries are also aging as per UN estimates, about 60% of the world population lives in countries with below replacement fertility level of 2.1. Now to common people, what is below replacement level of fertility mean 2.1? That is the average number of a children a couple will have during their uh, reproductive lifespan. But more is widely it is discussed that a fertility is 2.1 much less is discussed about the mod, uh, mortality and morbidity so a couple will have a 2.1 children provided they survive their reproductive lifespan okay so for a level playing field inequality based on gender caste religion disability and place of origin among other factors cannot be neglected further we cannot undermine human rights for example for example when a couple particularly a woman are forced to have more or fewer children without knowing their will or health status access to the information and services to help them make that decision to address these issues we need what informed choices awareness of our rights and most important a sense of responsibility world population day is a good opportunity to re to reflect on the global challenges which include chronic poverty illiteracy and health disparities health rights and justice are threatened by the same system of operations that over exploit the environment and drive the extension crisis resources use waste production and environmental degradations are not only accelerated by population growth so it's a misconception that is only accelerated by population growth but are further exacerbated by consumption habits note that it is a other exacerbated by consumption habits certain technological developments and resource management the solution can be achieved through equity sustainable consumption and production promoting human rights promoting reproductive health and rights widespread access to education fighting climate change and ensuring that everyone access is as access to food and water resources so what is the first step to achieve this the only way is if we know our population better world peace depends upon understanding people and upon understanding people they must have what good information as one rightly said if you do not have any facts you can't have the truth you can't have the trust if you do not have any of this you don't have democracy in several forums population is discussed as a problem and question arises are we just thinking in quantitative terms so as to run the system did we ever thought about the equality of quality of the life of the people are we a problem to each other whether we coexist or compete with each other to sum up rather than orienting our people to think about how efficient they will be to a system we should focus on how well equipped they are to run the system in the general discussion on the draft of the Hindu bill uh, debate, the Honorable Sri N. V. Gargil has said, In free India, I think there is only one caste, the caste of free man and one religion, and that religion is of humanity. Hence, let us invest in human and physical capi capital for inclusive, productive societies that uphold human values. Let us work towards space and opportunity for everyone to make a happier and peaceful place for all. Hence, my dear friends, 
World Population Day should be considered an opportunity to celebrate the spirit of togetherness and realize your responsibility towards one another. We have great challenges ahead and opportunities, which can be only achieved with mutual understanding and cooperation. In short, I would like to end my, end my speech by Sri Rabindranath Tagore's quote, For every child that is born, it brings with it the hope that God is not at disappointed with man. Thanks to all of you for listening to me with patience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam, for enlightening us about the significance of this caste census and World Population Day. Uh, let's move ahead to the first part of the program, which is the panel discussion. I know this audience are eagerly waiting for to listen our esteemed speakers. So for that, I would like to invite first Professor Prasant Bansode, sir, to come up, uh, come up on a dais. Professor Prasant Bansode playing a role of a moderator in the panel discussion. So Professor Prasant Bansode is a professor at the Center for Social Exclusion and Exclusive Policy and also heading the responsibility of Dean of Faculty at Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics. He holds his PhD degree in sociology from the University of Mumbai. His research is oriented toward understanding the marginality of the Dalits, Adivasis, and the depressed classes in general, and on caste, conflict, culture, capital, and exclusion of Dalits, seasonal migration, discrimination of tribal women, and vulnerability of tribes in particular. He has been the in charge of the Center for Study of Social Exclusion and Inclusive Policy, at the Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics. He has published several research papers in various national and international journals. He has also written two books, in one in English, another one in the Marathi language. His findings of some of his studies have been used for advocacy on important issues related to the empowerment of marginalized community. So now I would request Dr. Vini to come up on dance and Felicitate Professor Pansar Bansode. Thank you, Dr. Vini, for felicitating Pansar Bansode. So, with this, I will request. Professor Prasant Bansode to take the responsibility of panel discussion. Sir, over to you. Hello, uh, good afternoon all. Uh, I thank uh, you know, Bal Govind for introducing me. Actually, I'm an insider, so uh, uh, this is a very short and uh, a short introduction of mine. I thank you for him. And I also thank uh, uh, Dr. Ajit Ranadia, Vice Chancellor, for entrusting me this responsibility to uh, moderate the panel discussion on significance of caste uh, census. So straight away, uh, without wasting much time, I request all uh, our speakers to come on uh, stage. So I request uh, uh, Professor uh, Kulkarni, then Professor R.B. Bhagat, and uh, Professor Rajeshwari Deshpande to come on dais, please. Can I request our Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Ajit Ranade, to felicitate our esteemed panelists?
Okay, so uh, uh, let me introduce uh, Professor P. M. Kulkarni to all of you. Uh, he's a renowned demographer uh, and former professor of Center for uh, Study in Regional Development in Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. And uh, importantly, he was a consultant to such a committee which was formed to understand the status of uh, minorities in India. So he's, he has been engaged in teaching and research in India since 1976. Uh, prior to taking up the present position uh, at, as a professor uh, at the Department of Population Studies uh, uh, at the University of Coimbatore, uh, he was associate professor in the Institute for Social and Economic uh, Change, Bangalore. And uh, his research in interests include mathematical demography, fertility, family planning, population, population policy, health, social disparities, and more recently, Six ratio. He has published two monographs and papers in population studies, demography, genus, demography, Indian, uh, uh, other uh, research journals, very important research journals. So uh, uh, now I, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Ram Bhagat. Professor Ram Bhagat is uh, 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 is the head uh, department of migration and urban studies at the Indian Institute of Population St uh, Sciences, Mumbai and uh, uh, he has a, a master's degree in geography from the Center for the Study of Regional Development, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and uh, a PhD in demography from Indian Institute of Population Sciences, Mumbai. So uh, uh, Dr. Bhagat is currently associated with the uh, UNESCO UNICEF Indian Migration Initiative as a resource person and prepared two policy papers, namely Migrants Right to the City and climate change, vulnerability, and migration in India, uh, overlapping hotspots. So uh, his research area re interests uh, are in urbanization and right to the city, migration and development, demography of religion and caste, uh, politics of uh, demographic data, marriage and fertility, population and environment. So he's been on uh, important uh, uh, professional, uh, has a, uh, important professional memberships, and he is consulting uh, uh, for national and international agencies uh, in, in his uh, uh, area of studies. So the another, another panel and uh, panelist we have is Professor uh, Rajeshwari Deshpande. Uh, she is a senior professor at. Uh, the Department of Politics and Public Administration, Savitribai Phule, uh, Pune University, uh, where I did my master's, so <laughs> I know her since then. And uh, her specialization uh, is Indian politics and political thinking in India. And her research interest uh, is Indian politics, politics of the poor, urban processes, caste in contemporary India, political economy of religion, comparative studies of uh, Indian states, uh, political thinking in India, 19th and the 20th century political thought in Maharashtra, and Gandhian uh, traditions of thought. So uh, besides, you know, sh she has other academic accomplishments, and all of our, our panelists have significant uh, academic ac accomplishments in, in, in their respective areas. But I just want to mention her latest uh, uh, recent publication that is the last fortress of Congress domination uh, Maharashtra since the 1990s with uh, uh, Professor Suhash Parshikar. Uh, this is a sage publication in 2021. So uh, I welcome you all uh, to this uh, panel discussion and uh, as we have uh, very uh, distinguished and eminent uh, panelist here, uh, who is going to uh, speak uh, on significance of the caste you know, census. So in another five minutes, uh, with your permission, let me give the background of uh, the significance of uh, caste census, why you know, a caste census is important. So as uh, Dr. Vinnie was talking about you know, the World Population Day, and uh, immediately it, it, it struck me, uh, the, the uh, Malthusian ghost uh, about the, you know the population explosion and things like that, 
One of the things which we confront in Indian society is the whole issue of uh, you know caste, and it, it, it is in the same symbolic fashion. Maybe we can uh, call this as a uh, ghost in Indian society. So how do we you know deal with you know uh, this ghost uh, as you know uh, to use an important phrase by Dr. Ambedkar on uh, how to annihilate you know caste. So can uh, you know census as a uh, document itself become a, 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 a tool to annihilate, you know, caste. That's what uh, Satish Deshpande and others have really argued uh, in, in favor of, you know, doing the caste census. So uh, uh, it is on the very important, uh, you know, point of time that uh, the significance of caste census is being discussed and, you know, debated. We all know that uh, the importance of that is currently felt, especially in Maharashtra. So uh, it is two days uh, uh, earlier, uh, uh, yesterday's news that the Bantia Commission in Maharashtra has uh, you know, talked about uh, a short term and a long term uh, kind of a solution to extend you know, political reservations to the OBCs uh, in, in Maharashtra. So uh, in the long term, uh, uh, the uh, long term uh, solution is to go for a caste census. That's what uh, you know. Very latest you know news about uh, the uh, Bantia Commission on the extension. So, uh, on the one hand, uh, um, the the uh, census uh, caste census you know becomes very important because India is the largest demo democracy, and uh, uh, which which provides uh, uh, the affirmative action uh, to to various. Uh, deprived and the marginalized sections of the society. And therefore, you know, the caste census becomes, you know, very important. So the caste census, which was conducted in the colonial time right from 1981 to 1931, and it was discontinued after, you know, 31. Uh, 41, uh, they did document caste, and then uh, 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 they did not publish uh, caste-based, you know, data. So it is in uh, 2011 that, uh, the socio-economic caste census was being conducted. And this uh, socio-economic caste census was being conducted by the Ministry of Rural Development and not by the you know, census department as such. Because you know, as per the uh, Indian Census Act 1948, all information which is collected uh, be, you know, becomes more you know, confidential. So uh, it is in the post-independence time, we have adopted an, uh, a policy of you know, class, uh, caste blindness while you know documenting uh, uh, you know social realities of indian society and this caste blind you know policy has been continued since you know 1950s uh, and in contemporary times we really have felt the need you know for this uh, caste uh, you know census and uh, even gokul institute has been you know confronted with while doing the maratha reservation issue which uh, most of our faculty knows that, uh, that, that this specially you know socio economic caste uh, you know census data was not being you know published along uh, caste lines so indian government stand today is also of the uh, caste blind you know policy in 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 the uh, census so uh, 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 th there are you know different issues uh, then which you know come up for you know discussion as far as the uh, caste census is uh, concerned. So uh, they, they, they are you know, moral philosophical you know, nature in counting caste. So whether we can go for uh, count caste, whom to count? You know, uh, do we only count uh, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, o or OBC, and not all caste? Or do we have a general survey of all uh, you know, caste? So uh, the, uh, uh, another moral philosophical issues are whether forward uh, caste claim backward class status. Backward class uh, will inflate, you know, their numbers so that uh, they could retain the affirmative action policy. So, will it uh, increase, you know, cost, uh, caste consciousness? Uh, these are, you know, the moral philosophical, you know, questions of, you know, uh, doing caste census. Then there, uh, there are significant, you know, merits of uh, uh, doing the caste census. It is uh, important for you know evidence-based you know social policy. Uh, Caste-based data is very useful for uh, judiciary, 
for making important decisions in caste-based uh, policies. Uh, the caste census enables research on life conditions of different caste communities, and uh, it also helps document the social diversity of India. And uh, caste census would also uh, uh, help in the inclusion and exclusion of OBC communities from the list of the OBC uh, category. And uh, it is also said that it would lead to more democratization of Indian polity. So uh, uh, with this, you know, uh, can we move towards an uh, caste equality and a caste-free society? And as I've stated, you know, uh, Satish Deshpande's important, you know, quote here is that about to annihilate caste, count it. That's what uh, is uh, being uh, 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 emphasized here. But on the other hand, you also have uh, the enumerative methodology and operational you know, difficulties of you know, doing uh, caste uh, you know, census. The Indian government has taken a stand that um, the uh, caste census is administratively difficult and a very cumbersome kind of an exercise. So uh, uh, we all know that in the socioeconomic caste census, if you talk of Maharashtra, that uh, the, the caste, uh, number of you know, caste has significantly ballooned to more than you know, 4 lakh caste uh, of you know, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and the OBCs, when in fact you know, they are just uh, 434 castes. So you could see the inflation of you know, these numbers. So then the reliability of, uh, uh, of uh, documenting caste becomes an, uh, part of an enumerative methodology and uh, difficulties. And sociologically, you know, there are more important difficulties in you know, documenting caste than subcaste, uh, or you know, what is called as the micro and the macro nature of uh, you know, caste. How do we document it? What are the kind of you know, different methodologies we can evolve to document caste? So another Im important issue is what happens to the uh, children of you know, intercaste? Where do you, you know, document you know, that? And uh, what happens to those who do not reveal, want to reveal the caste? And, uh, you know, it would have, uh, 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 you know, more operational, you know, difficulties. So, and the main important question is how to overcome this. So, uh, uh, with this, you know, they, they identified, uh, we have identified, you know, four different issues for this, you know, final discussion and I have shared with uh, our esteemed panelists. So, uh, 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 I request uh, now the panelists uh, to speak for 10 minutes uh, each on the uh, themes which are being uh, shared uh, to them. So each one of them is going to speak for 10 minutes and um, if time permits, we go for a question and answer for five minutes. So I request uh, now uh, the panelists to uh, 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 go for you know this uh, their presentation, maybe 10 minutes each. There is a small announce announcement for audience. In your front seat, there is a QR code stuck. So you, uh, you can also post your question and query, query by scanning that QR code. After scanning, the one link will pop up. You have to fill the basic uh, information about yourself and you can post your question. We will try to address as many as we can. Thank you so much. Yeah, maybe Professor Kulkarni would like to go first. You can either speak here or from there also. You can either use this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Bansode. Uh, doubt set. I'm grateful to the Gokhale Institute for the opportunity to be here and share some of my views and to Professor Ranade, Vice Chancellor, Professor Turbini for the kind invitation. And thank you for, there, there are so many people here. I was wondering whether on a rainy day we will have many people in the hall, especially on an issue of population and so on, which is not a very popular uh, topic because I have been working in the field of population. I know very well that not many people would cut. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ronsode, for setting the tone. So I will not repeat, uh, of course, you have mentioned many of the things, you know, the background has been mentioned. So I will 
go straight to basically yes caste blind policy why caste blind policy and broadly there has been a consensus over time that the caste system as it existed or at yet exists now is undesirable there are inequalities in it there is inefficiency in it lack of freedom and so on and social reformers for a long time for centuries have campaigned against the caste system just not just now and of course since post past in post independence the independent india has also made efforts to basically eliminate the caste system annihilate abolish whatever term one wants to use it uh, what has happened in the 75 years well the system has weakened there is no doubt about it especially the caste occupation linkage has become now quite weak a person belonging to particular caste does not have to work and often does not work in the same occupation linked to the caste though still the domination it's there caste hierarchy upper and lower caste as it was widely accepted in the past by the society rightly wrongly of course is no longer that widely accepted it is broadly rejected however caste identity has persisted that has not gone out and one of the reasons is there is a caste endogamy caste endogamy has not vanished in fact it is persists to very strongly we see that in matrimonial advertisements and so on and as long as there is caste endogamy the caste identity will remain it is part of it you cannot do away with it identity as long as endogamy persists and therefore though one doesn't like to have caste system one would like castes to go away as completely the reality is that the identity persists and since that is there yes there is a need to have information about caste to have information about size of caste condition of caste uh, we need to have systematic information because often there are speculations there are many caste organizations consolidation is there in addition to the having caste identity and many make various claims about the size of their individual caste and if we add up all the claims you will probably get more than twice india's population because there is often exaggeration of the size of caste which is natural and therefore we need to have a clearer idea basically what we need to have is really clearer information of castes we don't like caste yet or caste system yet we need to have information this is required to our social justice because the caste system had existed was iniquitous and therefore there is a need for social justice it is also required for political justice because certain castes dominated power they were ruling caste what are called ruling caste in different ways not just as kings but even other ways and of course there has been an affirmative action there are special programs reservation is one part of affirmative action but there are other affirmative actions and there is an issue of representation in institutions particularly in institutions of governance parliament assembly etc so. plus there is an academic interest people in the academic areas are interested in various caste aspects and so on regardless of whether there has are implications for reservations affirmative action and so on and for that we need to have an identity of who are the deprived caste i understand who are the deprived caste how large are they how deprived they are what is their share in the population because that is required for various programs for various legislations for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes the issue has been fairly well settled because that was well accepted at the time of independence and even before independence and therefore we do have information on scheduled caste and scheduled tribes the censuses have been covering the information on scheduled caste scheduled tribes and there is a provision of social justice political justice representation in parliament assemblies and so on however for the other groups called other backward caste other deprived other than scheduled caste and scheduled tribes or obcs as has been widely as the acronym has been widely accepted we have certain issues first is issue of identification there have been narratives in the past narratives were used to identify backward communities social anthropological studies were used to identify backward communities but these are not adequate because they identify a few communities and not all a large number but we can have sample surveys household surveys or village surveys and this is something that was done by the mandal commission in when kalelkar commission did it but mandal commission did it much more systematically carried out a household survey a sample survey to villages per district 
and one urban area per district. That was done by the Mandal Commission. And the work was done by persons, expert in statistics. Dr. K. C. Seal, Director General of the CSO, was involved. And Dr. M. N. Srinivas, the eminent sociologist, they were involved in this work. They were the main advisors in this work. And they have done this work and pooled this information with other information and so on. And there have been state level commissions. However, many of the sample surveys cannot cover very small communities. There are many, many communities, as it was mentioned by Professor Bansar, many, many communities, and many of them cannot be covered by sample surveys. The shares of various communities, OBCs particularly, because SCST share, we have fairly good idea, that also needs to be covered. Now, for large communities, a sample survey is good enough to estimate the share. But for very small communities, where the share is very low, less than 1%, a sample survey is not really good enough. In fact, the Mandal Commission had recommended even to identify backward cost, a review after 20 years or a generation. And now it has been 40 years since the Mandal Commission report was submitted. In 1980, it was submitted. So we have not had that. Though some states have done certain reviews, and there have been certain issues with it. So essentially, those surveys have served the purpose of identifying backward classes in general, or backward castes in general. Often the term, word is used interchangeably, caste and class, that is how the backward classes are identified. For small communities, that is not enough. And to identify the share, we do have problems. Now, the, after 31 census, as it was mentioned, there has been no inclusion of caste except for scheduled caste, scheduled tribes in the Indian censuses. Till now, it has not been done. The Mandal Commission estimated the share of OBCs as 52% approximately using previous censuses and certain other information. Now, as far as, as a demographer, one can say that the share of OBCs is not likely to change over time and probably has not changed over time. For the simple reason that the demographic parameters of the OBCs, fertility and mortality, are very, very close to the national average. So the growth of OBCs is likely to be almost the same as the growth of India's population in general. So that is not the issue nationally. However, disaggregated at state and district level, because many states and would like to have reservations or affirmative action or political representation disaggregated. So within that, the shares may have changed. And what are the possible reasons? One is rural to urban migration. The rural to urban migration can be and possibly is caste selective. Certain castes have greater tendency to move to urban areas as opposed to certain other castes. In the past, say about 60, 70 years ago, mostly the white collar castes moved from rural areas to urban areas in search of white collar employment. Now, that is no longer true because all castes are now entering with white collar employment. But we do not know what is the extent of rural to urban migration, how that would affect the shares of caste in rural and urban areas. Second thing is there could be large interstate migration, which could possibly be caste selective. We are not very sure, because there is migration of labor and certain groups, workers, agricultural laborers moving from one state to another, say from Bihar to Punjab, or workers moving for plantation, as the, in the past they moved from Jharkhand and so on to Assam, belong to particular groups, scheduled tribes, and certain other, there could be certain other cars. Artisans could move from rural areas to urban areas in search of employment. So there are these possibilities. Agricultural distress could move agricultural communities to urban areas. So there are possibilities, and therefore, sample surveys are OK, all right, good enough for estimating shares at a national level. For estimating shares of communities, even at regional level, provided the group is large enough. But when you have very, very small groups, it is not good enough, because we need a large sample to see changes in the shares of small groups. If the share is 15 20%, it doesn't matter. Sample survey is good enough. But if the share is very small, less than 1%, we need a larger, very large sample, almost like a census. Ten minutes? OK. Yeah, I have, thank you. And therefore, there is a need for inclusion of caste in the census. Because certain things cannot be fully uh, done from sample surveys. And in fact, census serves both the purposes. 
uh, for purposes of estimating the shares or populations and looking at the degree of backwardness, the criteria used by Mandel Commission, except for two or three which were village level, almost all of them are available in the census uh, list of variables, census items. So most of the things one can also capture from the census, except what it is the social position as viewed by others. Other than that, everything almost. And in the census form, there is a question, question number eight, which asks whether a person belongs to SC or ST, yes or no, and if SC, ST, what is the cost? Now, suppose the question is asked, belong to SC, ST, yes, no, fine, and then what is the cost, regardless of whether person belongs to SC, ST or not? Right now, for non-SC, ST persons, cost is not recorded, not asked. Now, one can ask it. And the 2011 socio-economic cost survey tried to do this in a way. What was the problem, as it was rightly mentioned? Number of costs was large. Actually, number of costs is large, there is no doubt about it, but it is not as large as it appears. The problems were of spellings, of recording, of writing. And this made it very difficult for enumerators to get it. It is not difficult to ask what is the cost, but it is difficult to tabulate the data on cost. The question is of recording and tabulation. The question is not asking. People generally freely tell you what is the cost. There is not much hesitation except among, the, among some people who would not like to mention cost. Almost everyone is very, very free with the information on cost, sub-cost, whatever. That's not an issue. But it is proper recording, proper tabulation. And then what needs to be done? Well, what has been done for scheduled cast and scheduled tribes? There is a list of scheduled cast and scheduled tribe. There is coded and it is provided to census enumerators. Now, a similar thing could be done for all castes. I know, of course, it is difficult. It would be larger list, but some preparatory work has to be done, which means more social scientists need to be involved in work prior to the census, not just after census, so that we can have a reasonably cons reasonable list of all communities Minor variations one can always tackle, and if that is done, then one can bring in the issue of caste in the census. It cannot be done in the census as it is, as the present thing stands, because for this we need to have substantial advanced preparation. The 2011 socioeconomic census can be used, the information, to make a preparation for the census, next census, to bring in this information so that we can capture most of the information that we have. How to it is used, that I don't want to get into because that gets into the political matter. I'm speaking only from the point of view of the uh, procedural issues, how it can be done, and what would be the lines on which one should proceed for that. I think, but, yeah. thank you. Yeah. So uh, now I request uh, Professor Rajeshwari Deshpande to uh, make her points. Yeah, sure. And you would remind me, right? Yeah. Please do. Yeah. Uh, thanks to the Population Research Center of uh, Gokhale Institute uh, and also to all of you for having me here. A special thanks, um, uh, and it's a pleasure, great pleasure to share uh, the dais as well as uh, this meeting with Dr. Qureshi. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure. And special thanks to all of you uh, for involving me uh, in the discussion and debate, uh, a political scientist slash social scientist, uh, whereas population is often seen, as uh, Professor Kulkarni just said, it is often seen as a very uh, niche area for the demographers. Uh, but uh, since we are talking about well-being and rights of the population on this population day, I think it makes sense that social scientists and even natural scientists should also be involved uh, in this discussion and debate. Uh, and for this very pertinent kind of discussion on caste census, which in my mind I relate to the well-being of the population, uh, in a democratic society, in a very large democratic society. So thanks for inviting me here. Um, I would, uh, be, as a true political scientist, let us say, I would begin by suggesting that uh, this moment, uh, if we take a long-term view of this issue and discussion on caste census, uh, this moment represents what uh, I have elsewhere argued as the moment of a post-Mandal deadlock. 
we are witnessing a kind of deadlock uh, in our political imagination and in terms of our social imagination. Uh, we don't know what to do of caste. And we don't know how to deal with caste uh, for various reasons. And uh, so, so many issues ranging from the Bhatia Commission to uh, the most uh, recent uh, discussion on the, Ro the, the, the Rohini Commission uh, and several other issues, the reservations for Marathas, uh, forward castes claiming backward status, uh, uh, the policy of reservations or even mobilization of the Brahmins. We don't know how to deal with caste. And uh, the discussion on caste census is a part of that deadlock. That is what I'm trying to suggest to you. Um, this deadlock um, is not good for our democracy, obviously, uh, because democracy encourages contestations. We know that, and contestations are good. In fact, the entire debate on caste in the 1990s, you would recall, around uh, the process of mandalization and the post, uh, the, the mandal, uh, uh, mand mandalization of Indian politics, was good in, this, in that sense because it encouraged contestations. It encouraged contestations around representation, social justice, issues of social justice were brought forth for the first time. But deadlocks are not good. And, but this deadlock, really, uh, it has, it contains within it three different aspects of caste reality. Uh, and I'll come to the issue of caste census in a minute, but I thought that this backdrop of the three different issues of caste, three different aspects of caste reality are very important for us uh, to take ahead the debate on caste census. One is our affirmative action policy. For very valid historical reasons, we have chosen India as a democratic society we have chosen an affirmative action policy which uses caste as one of the basic indicators of social justice. And uh, I mean, there won't be any doubt about it that historically this was the most appropriate kind of action policy, affirmative action policy. Why? Because caste also in that sense represents class. And there is a social deprivation along with economic deprivation, but more importantly, there is also a deprivation of social dignity, social identity, something that Dr. Ambedkar was talking about throughout his life, and the Dalit movement and the social justice movement has been talking about it for such a long time. So affirmative action policy was put in place, which, but what the state, Indian state has done, if we take a long-term view of this entire debate, is that throughout its existence in the post-independence period, it has mainly encouraged a very thin dispersal of these resources which emerge from this affirmative action policy. So the entire affirmative action policy is reduced as if to the policy, uh, policy of reservations and that to reservations in the already shrinking government sector jobs. Uh, and the already shrinking public sector of ed uh, education. So the entire debate on social justice and affirmative action policy was unfortunately, again for various historical reasons, and we don't want to go into those right at this moment, but it was reduced to a very thin dispersal of resources. As a result of which, we see constant fights over the issue of reservations. Every caste is demanding reservations. Reservations into what? There is no, there are no, public sector uh, uh, opportunities. There are no jobs available, uh, but still the entire debate somehow gets uh, concentrated or gets uh, around uh, the policy of reservation. So in a way, this affirmative action policy legitimized caste, existence of caste. We can't wish away caste, and for other reasons also we can't wish away caste. But at the same time, it, provide, it reduced it to a very administrative, uh, very artificial kind of category. The state will decide which caste will sit where, whether it is an OBC caste or it is not. Right? So apart from its socioeconomic status, it was seen as a huge responsibility of the state. And it provided a great power to the state to decide the nature of caste realities. So that is one aspect which encouraged mobilizations in the 1990s, this legitimization of caste. But at the same time, it was very technically reduced to this administrative category. You can imagine OBCs, other backward classes, it's not a social identity really. Now it has acquired itself as a kind of social identity, but it began as an administrative category. Yeah? So that is one aspect. Uh, 
what this affirmative action policy or the way in which the state implemented affirmative action policy, I'm not suggest, uh, criticizing the affirmative action policy per se, uh, please bear with me. But I'm saying what the state did to that affirmative action policy and we need to take account, uh, account of that. Um, it, it froze caste. Whereas throughout this period, over the past 60 years, there was an inner dynamic of caste happening all along. And Professor Kulkarni mentioned about the weakening of the caste occupation linkages. It's not exactly true uh, because at the macro level, I mean, I'm not... Um, negating what he said, but at the macro level, I just did just a quick data check on uh, data from our national election studies, which is available with us, and which is a very large scale data, as some of you might know. But at the macro level, uh, the caste class kind of overlap still remains intact to a large extent. I mean, if you see among the upper castes, only 18% are poor, whereas if you go to the, um, the Dalits, 42% people are poor, class-wise. And if you go to Muslims, 35% people are poor. Among the uh, Adivasis, 43% people are poor. This is just a rough kind of a sketch of NES data. But my point is that in spite of this, the macro-level realities where caste and class overlap still remains intact, we also see a lot of changes in the inner dynamic of caste. So what Professor DL said, uh, or Satish Deshpande's studies, sociologist Satish Deshpande, uh, what Professor D.L. Seth has described famously as classicization of caste. So within each caste, you will find at least a minute, very small share of middle class, at least a very small share of upper class. So that classicization or internal economic stratification has taken place within castes. We need to recognize that. But what this legitimization of caste by the state and what we often call as in the derogatory sense of the term, the politics of caste does is that it freezes caste. It freezes communities. And it simply gives legitimacy to certain communities. And identity politics, as Sir was suggesting, identity politics provided a possibility to consolidate this frozen identity of caste. So there were the number of caste communities were inflated uh, and the actual share of population of a particular caste community was inflated by the caste organization simply because of the fact that castes remained important in politics, but they were internally becoming vacuous. So there was a need to like shout uh, even more in a more louder manner to claim a certain kind of share for each caste and community. So as a result of that, we know, and that's why I call it a deadlock, we know that now the whole idea of social justice, what was imagined uh, earlier in the early Independence Day, is reduced to, it is flattened to the idea of reservations for each and every community. So we have reduced from the so the, the texts of social justice, the narratives of social justice, to the narrative of quota. Why do we need caste census? Because we want to know how many people are there in each community. So when Brahmins, for example, or the upper castes demand reservations, there is a complete flattening of the reservation discourse. And this idea of social justice moves to the idea of, idea of quotas in representation, quotas in uh, educational institutions, etc. And this is a kind of deadlock that we have arrived at. And that's where the forward castes like Marathas or forward castes, uh, the entrenched castes uh, in the traditional social hierarchy also started demanding reservations. Now there is a completely different story attached to it and we can go into that later on if you want. But so uh, whether caste census would be able to help us to uh, come out of this deadlock? Definitely not completely because caste census is also just one kind of exercise. But I think to a certain extent, yes caste census would help us to understand and uh, 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 to open up this deadlock, to help us free uh, from this uh, deadlock. Um, why is it, yeah, I'll just finish, yeah. Why is it necessary? A, because this fossilized understanding of caste needs to go. And caste realities need to be more transparent. So I completely agree with Professor Kulkarni that what we need is to just to add one column to the census. Please remember that this other exercise 
of independently judging the socio-economic status of every caste is not still not that useful because we can't relate then caste status to its social and economic status with all its nuances. But we have and we, uh, we, we are very proud of the census exercise. So why not simply add one column to the census and uh, collect every detail of every caste community? It will basically make caste more transparent. Yeah, I won't go into other op operational issues because uh, he has already handled it. But I think in order to address, uh, there is also a fear uh, of this caste census, and that is a major kind of objection to the idea of caste census. There is a fear that caste census would lead to legitimization of the politics of quota. And that's a very real fear. I agree with it. And therefore, what I would suggest, uh, echoing again many other social scientists, I mean, this is definitely not my suggestion, but many social scientists, uh, more eminent social scientists, have already given this suggestion to the government and to the policymakers, is that we need to move to a more multinodal, more plural, uh, more inclusive uh, idea of social justice, which can be arrived at uh, through an Equal Opportunity Commission. An Equal Opportunity Commission, which would take into account not only the social indicators of caste as the basis of affirmative action policy, but along with caste, many other dynamic indicators like one's regional origins, one's medium of instruction, uh, the, the language of uh, instruction in school, the gender, one's gender, uh, one's class, all these parameters, if we bring them together along with caste census, in the aftermath of caste census, that would, we would be able to uh, create more transparent caste realities. As a result of that, we would be able to create more efficient, more plural, more inclusive variety and narrative of the idea of social justice, affirmative action policy. And we would also be able to come out of this shackles of uh, frozen caste community logic. Which, is, which has resulted in this kind of a deadlock uh, around the existence of caste. So on the one hand, we are celebrating caste um, at, at different levels, and at the same time, we, we are wishing it away. This wishing away business is not possible as we know, and as Satish Deshpande had said in one of his other famous essays, that it is only the upper caste who can become casteless who can claim to be casteless. Only the upper castes can afford to claim that caste doesn't exist. But if we understand that caste exists, and caste exists in both its social, economic, as well as cultural expressions at various levels, uh, and so many narratives are there, and we know that it is still an unequal kind of major of our social reality, we need to understand it. And for understanding it better, I think caste census would help, at least in a limited way. I'll stop here. Thank you. So, uh, can I request uh, the uh, other panelist, uh, Professor Ram Bhagat, to share his ideas? So, thank you, Professor Bansode, and thank you to Gokhale Institute for inviting me. Uh, thanks to Bini, Bal Gobind, and Dr. Ranade uh, for this invitation. And it is my also pleasure to meet uh, today Dr. Kuresi, who is former election commissioner of India. So it is nice uh, occasion, and uh, most of the things have been said by our two panelists. And uh, I don't disagree with any of them, but maybe that I will be adding some more material. To, to begin with, that caste is a reality, social reality of India. It continues to be social reality of India. And why so? Why after 70 years of economic development, we could not annihilate caste, or it has not happened the way it has happened in the West, in 17th, in 18th and 19th century, where there was massive industrial revolution accompanied by massive rural to urban migration, where villages disappeared and dependence on agriculture reduced 
So there was no agriculture almost, or no agrarian crisis as such. And in that context, primary group uh, dissolved into secondary group. Now, this type of expectation was not fulfilled in India or in the trajectory of India's economic development, but rather what we find that caste has been evolving. So caste is a social reality in India, and caste at the same time evolving. So when I say caste has been evolving, there are many things of the caste which has been uh, eroded or disappeared, but many new things have been ha is also coming up. So one of the things that is no longer true is when we look at caste in terms of Varna, fourfold Varna system. This was also earlier not true, fourfold fold Varna uh, in many parts of the country was not applicable. We also don't find true Jajmani system because market has intruded, there is a wage labor, there is a rural to urban migration, no longer that uh, a community can be tied with land and the Jajmani system in agrarian structure can work. So this has uh, eroded, this has uh, disappeared. Purity and pollution, which was the backbone of caste system, no longer true. Maybe uh, some form here and there you can, uh, we may see resurfacing, but by and large. Then what is happening with caste? Caste has become an identity. It has become a network. And when we say it is an identity, it is a network, it is no, it is the basis, uh, the foundation is provided by endogamy, as Professor Kulkarni has said. It is the kinship and uh, marriage and kinship that pro um, provides the foundation of this network, but it is not confined to marriage and kinship. It goes into labor market, it, it is in the social network, it is in the political network. There is a wider network uh, in which caste operates. <coughs> then when this network operates, what happens? This network becomes resource. And this resource becomes a some sort of advantage and accumulation for the higher groups. So caste is used as, a, as an instrument of accumulation and advantage, whereas for the others, it is a disadvantage and dis discrimination. It works through market. It works through technology. So it is very, and it works through politics. So it is very, uh, this important dimension that has been added to the caste. So caste continues to be important, and we need to uh, continue, uh, need to understand that. Now several studies show that uh, caste is very important factor in social economic inequality. Whatever inequality you take, decompose it statistically, you find caste is very important. Income inequality, educational inequality, health inequality, we are doing a lot of research on health inequality in our institute. Caste continues to be important. So if inequality becomes important and inequality is driven by network and identity, capturing economic, political, social resources, how can we wish away caste? Therefore, we need to understand how its dynamics and caste census is very, very important in this respect. It is also uh, worthwhile to mention that India's uh, affirmative uh, social policies are let down in the Constitution. Dr. Deshpande already said this. And it, it is committed to improve the condition of socially and educationally backward classes. And so it is important that we must have data on this. Uh, how to do it? What are its challenges? Uh, those are also issues uh, to be uh, also encountered. Uh, we see that uh, uh, caste has been preoccupation in our censuses in British time. And British uh, census commissioners, they were anthropologists. Now our census commissioners are IS officers. So, so when census started, the great uh, anthropologists, they were occupying this chair. So Herbert Riesley, uh, J.H. Hutton, E.H. E. Gate, all these uh, uh, 
people were occupying, and they tried to classify. Actually, in 1936, there was a order, scheduled caste order uh, of 1936 that officially recognized uh, the listing of caste in every province of India. So scheduling of the caste started. Uh, next. Uh, what we find in recent time, and that is, of course, linked with Mandal and the 1990s, and this also coincides with India's economic policy of liberalization and privatization. And we find that the, uh, uh, the implementation of Mandal Commission recommendation was upheld by Supreme Court in 1992. Then we find that National Commission of Backward Classes Act was enacted in 1993, in which it, it was said that the OBCs will be a dynamic category. Some caste will be included, some caste will be excluded. Then we find that the Central Educational Institution Reservation in Admission 2006 came, where there was admission quota in admissions in the colleges and university. Then in 2018, there was a very important uh, change that the SC, uh, the Backward Classes Commission has been made constitutional authority through constitutional amendment. So constitutional status to National Commission for Backward Classes since uh, 2018. And so caste census, uh, all these legislative developments makes it imperative that we must have caste census and we know about the caste and their numbers. Uh, already it has been said that uh, about the socioeconomic caste census was held in 2011, but it was not held as a part of census of India, that is population census, but it was separately conducted by Ministry of Rural Development for rural areas and Urban Ministry of Housing and Urban Poverty Alleviation for urban areas. Actually, what, what was that, what was the difference and what is now practice and how we can improve uh, our census questions so that uh, uh, the different uh, castes and individual castes names could be captured and their population could be uh, known. So if you see, if we compare this uh, population census 2011 and socioeconomic caste census that was held in 2011. So as you know that the census that asked question on SCST. So there is a question number eight, I, uh, Professor Kulkarni has already said, I, I'm making it more clear. Question number eight A is, it asks, is the person SCST? Then the if, yes, then code one and for SC, uh, ST for two. If no, then write three. So we have SC, ST, and others. And if SC, ST, write the name of the SC, ST individual caste. So that is all about. And this is as per list given. Lists are prior, is prepared in prior. And the list has be, to be given, is given to the enumerators. And enumerators accordingly see, check, that the name of the list and enumerate the population. So 2011, there were uh, about 1,221 SC individual cast and 661, 63 ST. Now similar type of questions were added in socioeconomic caste census 2011, but list was not given. So what has happened the list which was confined, which was earlier prepared as per notification of the President of India uh, for SCs and STs, that list was not used. So every SC and ST was asked, what is your caste? That has also inflated the figures. So th these are some of the innovative methodological issues that can be sorted out. So what I like to suggest that the problem is not of enumeration. Problem is not of counting. 
problem is of listing. How to list our castes? When we have a list of SC and STs, we have also a list of OBCs as per Backward Classes Commission of India. Now you take that list and then rest of the people, uh, more data can be collected, who can be included, who cannot be included. I think listing is a major problem. If you want a caste census, don't go with a questionnaire and ask uh, information from the household. Let us prepare the list. How to prepare list? We have Panchayati Raj system. Who knows caste? Let me tell you, if you want to know my caste, either I can tell you what is my caste or you have to go to my village by my caste. It is the best person, best entity is Panchayat. List the number of castes in the Panchayat. Government has a system, apparatus, government apparatus. And once you have a list is complete, go to the census. Going census, doing census and trying, uh, collecting information and then classifying, we are landing into the problem. So this is a methodological issue. Caste census E is a problem of listing. It is not a problem of enumeration. So I will end here. Thank you very much. So uh, we have, you know, three distinguished panelists and uh, they have given their viewpoints on the significance of caste census. And uh, I think all of three are in affirmative, uh, in, uh, affirmative in terms of, you know, going first uh, for a caste uh, census. And uh, all of them have uh, emphasized that uh, there should be, you know, caste-based census. So, um, uh, it is, uh, it, uh, it is important for, uh, all, all the panelists have stated, it is important for having a more inclusive kind of an uh, uh, policy, uh, 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 affirmative action you know, policy, and uh, also to document the uh, social diversity of you know, various communities. So it is not only limited uh, to the affirmative action, but it is also to count on the uh, different uh, uh, social diversities that we have and also uh, a, a, a kind of instrument to identify the uh, forward and the backward you know, ca kind of caste which would lead to a kind of a comparative analysis about uh, who are the for forward and the backward. So uh, since we are, uh, we are running over time, uh, I would uh, like to you know, shorten the Q&A part maybe for five minutes. So uh, uh, I'll open uh, this panel discussion for qu uh, question and answer. Maybe for five minutes, uh, uh, we have a question and answer. Very uh, specific, very pinpointed you know, questions uh, to the panelist. Uh, 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 maybe you can you know, introduce uh, yourself very shortly and to whom you want to address your question. So it is over to uh, uh, you all to you know, raise a uh, you know, question, very short, very specific. Yes. Please introduce yourself and to whom you want to uh, ask the question. Good evening, Madam Panel. Uh, my name is Dilip Shivra. I'm a research scholar here. My question is to Dr. Deshpande. Uh, Dr. Deshpande, you uh, in a very short uh, said about a new social justice commission. Now, that was a very interesting thing that we are talking about caste. Government is really scared to touch this topic, considering that the moment we have the numbers in hand, there will be so many new groups coming up to us, asking us for the quota reservation, as uh, Dr. Kulkarni said, that it is a more of a quota and a reservation thing now. So as government is not touching that, as it, uh, government is so reluctant, that the Pangaria committee that was there, not even the members were appointed to that committee till 2013, considering that we don't want to touch this sensitive topic, and caste is a very emotive topic in the Indian society. So why haven't we given more thought to, as you said, about a new social justice commission which will take care of most of our society rather than categorization them? I appreciate the point that Dr. Bhagat said that we really need to know the variety in our society. But when it comes to the development, why aren't we seeing entire population as one rather than we are insisting on just adding one more column to our census? 
So the question yeah. is, why not a new, more elaborative commission to think about the entire development rather than focusing on the cost for the development? Thank you. She is talking about equal opportunity commission. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. My short answer would be that this was a suggestion. This was a suggestion by some academics, and so there, there, there was not any political constituency to support this idea. But I think the social, there is a need to build a social constituency uh, around this um, suggestion of equal opportunity, which will, along with caste, uh, take into consideration many other factors of social deprivation and create a cumulative kind of index, something that JNU does in its admissions. Uh, yeah, uh, it is again for Professor Desh Pandey. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, when uh, Professor Kulkarni said that is uh, there is a the linkages caste occupation linkages are uh, weakening now, but uh, you from your survey you have given certain figures like 43 percent uh, tribals are poor and so I mean I understand that but uh, it is a cross section right at that point of time they were uh, so many but what has happened over the time in the over the time that 43 percent now must have been 67 percent or whatever. So, I mean, over the time it is weakening or over the time this classicization of the caste might go down. It's that it, it will increase. It will increase. Um, it, yeah. it, it will increase. It will increase. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, isn't it? I mean, uh, so we have to see it, uh, what is happening over the time, I mean, the longitudinal, I mean, rather than just the cross-section. Should I quickly reply? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very short. Yes, uh, again, my sh a quick reply would be that I was looking at just a snapshot of data for you because of want of time. But uh, many studies, not only this national election studies that I was mentioning to, but many other studies, as you know very well, uh, they have given us two possible uh, scenarios. One is there is definitely at the macro level, the relationship between caste and class, that is in other words, social inequalities, which were imbibed in caste and economic inequalities, uh, the, at the macro level, this pattern remains intact hmm. in spite of our, what we call as development. So at the macro level, this pattern is in, intact and not only in terms of economic inequalities, but also in terms of cultural deprivation. We see atrocities against Dalits committed in cities. So that is a marker of uh, the, uh, the caste being alive. And so at the macro level, this remains intact. At the micro level, yeah. though, so many studies have suggested that A, the caste and traditional occupation linkages have been breaking in, in a very limited way. And each caste has its own trajectory. Like, for example, for Matangs, it would be different. And for Mahars, it would be different, etc. So for each caste, it would be different. But at the micro level, this traditional linkage breaking and also uh, classicization of caste. That is, internal economic stratification within every caste is also happening. This is the dynamic that we need to recognize. But as long as we fossilize caste and see it as only one kind of community, we are not going to recognize this dynamic. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Prof. Yeah, Dr. Ajit Ranadip. I know time is running short, but very, very briefly, if you could, uh, any of the panelists could answer this question. What is your advice? to the uh, election commission, the state election commission of Maharashtra or the Supreme Court out of the deadlock. We have no elections <laughs> because of the OBC census. Uh, actually, I don't want to give advice as such because I know there are so many people like uh, but basically the issue is, if we want to do any caste census, we need to have adequate preparation. We cannot just jump into it. And this has been one of the issues. I think the social economic survey, as Professor Bhagat rightly mentioned, and as I also mentioned, the social survey, did not provide a list of things. There is a way for conducting a census, there is in, a, in an organized way, and that requires a lot of preparations. If we just jump into it, we often get into problems. Now, very often, the political issues, as you have rightly mentioned, 
you know, in Maharashtra, the burning issue right now is, yes, we need to have election, we also need to have the counting and so on. Now, doing these things in such a short time is something that is very difficult, that could be questioned, it could be defective. I hope things work out well, but there are problems. We do need to have time. We have to invest. It cannot be done, done just because when there is, it is like digging a well when you are thirsty. No, this, giving the old adage. So that is something that cannot be done. We need to have good preparation. I think the Bantia. Uh, yeah. I'm tempted to add a one line. My advice to the people who are thinking about doing something like this is that as I said, nobody really listens to the advice of academics. <laughs> but my advice uh, would be to political parties. Because mm. this is an issue in Maharashtra, the issue is about political backwardness of mm. the OBCs. What we are trying to count uh, is political backwardness. So my advice to political parties would be to field OBC candidates, as many as possible, uh, mm. in order to overcome this crisis of OBC reservations. Same is the case with women's reservations. Yeah. Census. Now, census should be part of Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment or Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. And tribal affairs. Why? Yeah. Yes, any. Yeah. Why should be part of the Ministry of Home Affairs? That is a big question. Because after all, when we discuss about population issues, population problem, there is a Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So we know we study on birth rate, death rate, infant mortality rate, everything data comes from Ministry of Health and Family. But then census is part of the ministry. This is a colonial legacy, let me tell yeah. you. British government started census to govern the people. But now census has become an instrument to protect the rights of the people. It has changed the context and therefore we change the, uh, its uh, location also. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. There is just uh, one, one uh, question from you know, Facebook uh, Live. Uh, and I, there are three, uh, w w three questions and a comment, uh, two questions and two comments, but there's one very uh, uh, interesting question which is raised by Professor Ram Deshpande, and uh, he's asking to the panelists that can the caste census address any of the caste-based discrimination issue? Uh, and the census data will be uh, more used for achieving political ends. So uh, he just wants a comment on, on it. It is for politicians to decide. Okay. That is for everybody. But the data are there. What, how, do they use? how do they use? How do they use? It is for politicians yeah. to decide. The caste discrimination is there, caste inequality is there. That is what existing data are telling us. National Family Health Survey, if you take it, wealth quintile, what Professor Des Pandey has quoted. We have recent figure also. Hmm. That what is that uh, uh, those who are at the bottom quintile or the second bottom quintile? And we find this disparity, or even disparity increasing. So this is one. But we don't know the individual caste, where they are located, in which state, and that's why the census. Yeah. And of course, it will be some helpful. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, very short, very specific, very short one. Hello. My question very is short, to huh? Professor Bhagat. Uh, sir, Government, according to Government of India, they find out a scientific way to use socio-economic consensus to provide welfare to the pro poor instead of using poverty line method. So they provided housing for all facilities under the Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana using socio-economic consensus. So we all knew that ki there were so many mistakes in the socio-economic consensus, but still they used that to provide housing facilities and uh, through the convergence of Mandega schemes. But when I went Can you to come the, to your question, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, we, we are so running out of time. On the ground, in a village, when all people are from the same equal income status or the lower income background, only 10 out of 40s are getting uh, household facilities, uh, facilities under Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, but other 40 are not getting that. So isn't it SECC, socio-economic caste census, creating a conflict inside the village for the development of them? You are right. Not only Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, but Ayushman Bharat also, uh, that, which is a very big flagship program. And this is uh, uh, identified based on socioeconomic caste census 2011. Now, we require transparency. Whatever data is there, that should be displayed at a village level, at a panchayat level, at a block level. We, we, we should also have access so that academician can do 
uh, auditing or the student can do auditing. Matter is of transparency. And then when government is using already this data, why this data is not given to, to the public domain? Of course, let it be 46 lakh cast. We are going to analyze, academicians are going to analyze what, how this 46 lakh cast, what are surnames or what is linguistic differences or whatever is that. So I think transparency uh, is very important along with quality of data to further see and uh, 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 provide the services. Thank yeah, Th thank you so much uh, all the panelists. And maybe I take this opportunity uh, uh, to uh, our Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Rajit Ranade, that maybe we can have a uh, one-day workshop on on this uh, uh, very important issue because you know there are a lot of uh, que question and un uh, which are coming up. Uh, the panelists are available after uh, after another session. Maybe you can interact uh, you know later with the panelists because we are running out of time. So uh, can I request? Give a big round of applause to our panelists. And I thank all the panelists on behalf of Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics. And I, I hand it over to uh, Dr. Bal Govind for the next program.